All right, guys, welcome to the second episode of the Community Currency Alliances show, which is, of course, hosted with me here on the Common Stacks YouTube channel. And today we're talking to Julio. Say hi, Julio. <laughs> Hello, how is it going? I'm doing good. Hey, Anton. Hey, so I know, Julio, that your project is about universal basic income. So maybe you could just start a bit by elaborating on what, what that even means for you from your perspective and how mm -hmm. the project works with that. Great, yeah. So yeah, first of all, the project is called Circles, Circles UBI. Um, and uh, to your question, um, a, a basic income, a universal basic income or an unconditional basic income, uh, it's normally defined uh, but the basic income earned network as a um, uh, periodic uh, cash transfer that is given to people on an individual basis unconditionally. So without any uh, means testing or work requirements, uh, you just get it as a right, so to say. Um, and it's also given uh, to everyone in a political community or in a, a specific uh, universe, no? So that's the universal part. So it's for everyone. Um, so these sort of uh, five characteristics that I mentioned, that it has to be periodic in a stable means of payment, uh, individual, universal, and unconditional, form the sort of basis of, a, of what a basic income is uh, or should be. Now, in practice, um, of course, these are like high ideals, but in practice, the, uh, the way that uh, a lot of basic income systems and basic income uh, policies or pilots have worked, have different uh, of these five uh, principles in different, uh, let's say, thresholds or, or levels. So uh, Circles is a protocol that allows people to issue money uh, into the world uh, and then exchange exchange it for the stuff that they that they need. So in a, in a very simple sense, it's just a protocol where everyone gets the unconditional right to issue money as a basic income, uh, so not as debt uh, that you have to pay back with an interest to a bank uh, or you know in some form of taxation, but just direct monetary creation from the perspective of people uh, that then can be used to uh, create local economies. So uh, when enough people join in circles, they can start to exchange with each other um, set prices and then start giving stuff as well so it's um what we say is that circles is a it's a basic income system for communities so that um if you have uh let's say uh, a village or a specific municipality or whatever the local sort of regional social form that we're dealing with um they can essentially use the the software the system the protocol as a way of issuing basic income out from a bottom-up perspective. So it's not the government that's given the basic income. And then sort of like, uh, uh, normally it's imagined that the state sort of takes out money from one new side and then sprays it out in another. Uh, in this sense, really the money is issued from a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, perspective and then you create trust relationships with people. So that then the, uh, the ecology, so to say, can then grow. <laughs> So yeah, it is based on trust. So in that sense, we get a lot of uh, uh, <laughs> very interesting comments from people who think that because Circus runs on a blockchain, uh, it has a commodity uh, backing. So as you know, most, most cryptos are digital assets in the sense that you can buy them and sell them yeah. uh, with state money. Uh, with Circus, that's not the case. You can only join Circus if three people trust you uh, or if you are a bit more hacky, you can send uh, some XDAI onto the safe so that you can deploy an account and then you can start to issue the money. But still, the system doesn't really work unless there are people who trust you. Uh, because trust, uh, when someone trusts you, it means that they're willing to accept uh, your circles. So you only really ever accept circles from people directly from people who you trust. But we do this trust uh, system. This, it's called technically a web of trust. It works as a, in a way to say, what if I want to pay the Pope, you know, or if I want to pay a baker that I don't really know, but it's part of the broader community. Uh, I can do this through the trust network, the trust uh, system, 
um, via this analogy that we use called the six degrees of separation. So there is an algorithm that finds uh, the trust connections between people and says, okay, this is the shortest path. We can send money from each individual people until it gets to the to the baker or the pope. So that's uh, more or less how it works. Um, I could go on there. I mean, there are many like technical aspects to it, but I think uh, uh, I don't know what you want to focus on more. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. That makes sense. I really like how it's very, I guess you could say kind of decentralized in that way as well, because as you mentioned, it's not just a universal basic income in the sense that everybody just gets some fiat money from the state. It's more like when you create your account, right, it's generated. And then within your local ecosystem, you can transfer the currency that you get on your account to the people that you trust, right? Exactly. So what, exactly. what do you exactly. think are some like practical use, use cases for this? Would it be like in any sort of local communities or are there specific ones that you would focus on? Or how do you see that kind of mm. developing? Yeah, so um, I think um, personally, I push a lot for a, a municipalist approach to doing basic income um, because I see that, uh, you know, local forms of government, whether it's cities, city states or, you know, municipal uh, level governments such as the Kommune uh, here in Germany in or yeah, it really depends on the country, but essentially like uh, going more towards like these local forms of government and also doing forms of governance that is more uh, democratic at the local level with participative democracy, I think is a good way to implement basic income from the bottom up because it's also a way where you can scale it up and federate it as sort of you grow more from like the local municipal level to the more regional to the more uh, federative. So yeah, I think politically that's the most interesting to me uh, and something that we push for as well uh, so that you know not just not just within circles but in the broader basic income movement now I'm, I'm trying to push for that more um, because I think that um, you know in general when it comes to the political will that it takes for a politician to take on and say hey we're gonna issue basic income to all these people not many politicians are really for it it did happen recently actually in South Korea where um, what was first a mayor of a city became then a governor after implementing a, a one of the biggest basic income uh, systems to date, and then he ran for the presidency. So he went from mayor to governor to presidential uh, uh, nominee, and, and he almost won actually. He got in second place this was a few months ago, and so there you see a clear example of how uh, you know so you know you could start at the very local level and then grow it all the way to the national. So he actually pledged that if he were to win, then all of South Korea would get a basic income, which unfortunately didn't happen. Uh, but I think that's that's definitely a, a tactical, a strategic way forward. Yeah, that's really cool. That's really cool. And I saw uh, regarding that in your white paper as well, you mentioned that like the the political enthusiasm for a universal basic income, it is there, but progress is really slow compared to like what most uh, normal citizens think of UBI, which is pretty, pretty nice, pretty enthusiastic. So like, do you see maybe the political space going more and more in a positive direction in terms of a UBI, why? UBI, sorry. And are you guys doing anything to change that sentiment or is it more like just uh, in the way that you are creating the project and evolving it over time? Yeah, I think um, in general, I think especially uh, now with the pandemic and the growing uh, inflations and supply chain disruptions and so on, uh, more and more people within government see basic income as a as a tactical and, and yeah way policy to uh, sort of create stability in these times of crisis. Now, I do think that it's important to say that you know most most of the social rights that we have today are really we're really like uh won by people who struggle for them whether if it's uh you know having uh, uh access to a weekend or you know 40 hour work weeks uh now people are arguing for, for having like a three-day weekend and so on um I, this these are all things that our ancestors uh, fought for in different ways you no know, women's rights uh um you know abolishing apartheid segregation and so on 
these are all like social struggles that uh, really, you know, a lot of people took on and it's the same with basic income. So uh, I think that, you know, things like circles are interesting because they provide the technological framework for the political movement that basic income is to say, what if we don't wait for the state? What if we just do it? And then the state has to kind of acquiesce and says, yes, okay, we have to give it to people. So we're trying to push more from this bottom up perspective to say, uh, you know, to basically get the people in power to accept that it has to happen. You know, it won't happen if people don't struggle for it. And do you feel like the when when you talk to politicians, for example, do are they more inclined to adopt uh, a UBI? Sorry, in the sense that you guys are making it, or more in the like? Because when I think of a standard universal basic income, it's more like what we talked about earlier with the state just kind of giving you money. Is there kind of a way they're leaning there, or? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you see how, for example, now there are pilots uh, emerging more at the municipal levels in places like Catalonia, um, and also in places like Greece. I was talking to some majors in Greece, for example, who are very keen on trying something in the islands and so on, but they do see uh, the challenges coming from more the legal perspective. So um, especially if you do it with uh you know from so uh social uh money or social currencies it's uh it can be tricky because of the legislation so as you may know um today in most countries in the world only the state is allowed to issue money yeah so local forms of government are not really allowed to do that so it, it, you need a bit of a hack to figure out ways in which you can tactically get to a place where either you issue basic income through uh the state money and find ways to fund that, or you create these types of uh, social currency systems that can tap into other forms of taxation that are more regional and so on, but that still can provide people with an income. So in the case of South Korea that I explained before, that happens also with a local currency uh, that is you know, paid in a debit card or in a QR code, also in digital forms to about, I think it's 120,000 people. Uh, H24 and 240,000 farmers. So it's it's really big in terms of its size. Also in the city of uh, America, in Brazil, uh, there is also a basic income uh, uh, system there that is given to about 40,000 people, if I'm not mistaken, 42,000 people, um, which is still targeted to people below the poverty line, but it's unconditional once you have it. So it is uh, quite an interesting way forward because there, there the government, the local municipality, had access to a lot of revenues from an oil fund. And they said, what do we do with this? Okay, let's give it to people as a basic income and let's create a sovereign wealth fund so that we can invest the, the returns over this fund because we know that we cannot live off uh, oil for uh, forever, right? Um, and so this also has influenced a lot of local governments now in Brazil. So... I think it's definitely, there is definitely a push for that. Also in the U.S., uh, there is a, even a network called uh, Mayors for Guaranteed Income, inspired by Martin Luther King and many others there. Um, yeah, so I think there is different approaches and tactics towards getting there. Um, I spoke once to the mayor of Pittsburgh, I remember, in the U.S. Uh, at some panel, and he was really keen on trying out these ways forward because he said, okay, if we issue some sort of basic income, uh, what could people use it for locally? Could it be for the bus ticket as well? What type of public services at the local level or public goods could be accessed via this basic income uh, so that we can incentivize its uh, circulation? Say. So there's definitely a movement towards there because at the end of the day, you know, local politicians, they do, ideally, they do care more about impacting the lives of people uh, in their constituencies, whereas the sort of people in the Supreme Court or the you know, higher levels of government, they don't really have a direct connection to, to their to their to their people, to their constituents. So, yeah, I think I think there is more of a chance there. So let's see what happens. <laughs> yeah, that's really interesting, really interesting. And I think also, like the kind of the the positive attitude towards your project probably aligns pretty well with how blockchain is getting introduced in general into the public. And also, you mentioned like a bus ticket. That could also be stuff like NFTs and, you know, all that jazz. So I guess it's kind of developing alongside the rest of the space. But I'm, I'm just yeah, wondering also what now? Sorry, you go. 
No, 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 please, please. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm just wondering, like, what stage the project is in also currently. Are you guys, have you guys rolled out in any local communities yet, or is it still in the development phase, or...? No, no, definitely. We, we launched Circles in uh, 2020 at the end in October. And since then, we had a lot of uh, uh, support and interest from many communities all over the world. Um, yeah, I think, I don't remember the exact number now, but it was about 120,000 uh, saves that were deployed uh, with people joining the, the web of trust and so on. Definitely the biggest um, uh, amount of people that are using Circles are in Berlin. Because we run a pilot here in Berlin, um, where we, you know, work with local businesses uh, and you know have monthly assemblies, and we try to build community so that uh, people can spend their basic income uh, with local producers. So we really have this focus on, you know, who is producing food, who is giving local logistic services, uh, you know, forms of uh, care work, uh, uh, body work, uh, you know, uh, office spaces. Uh, yeah administration support taxes whatever like all of these things how do, how can people access them in circles so that they can actually pay for the basic stuff right so it's interesting because the question is not doesn't doesn't become about where will the money come from but where will the stuff of the basic income come from <laughs> which is yeah. actually i think a question that not many people ask uh, and with this pilot we've really seen how how that is really a, very important because uh you know i can make money Anyone could make money right away. Like I can take this piece of cloth, rip it into pieces, and then give it out to people, and you know, say it's money, and that they can claim stuff for it, and you know, uh, yeah, you, but know, you have to validate it other, in sense. and there has to be a consensus exactly. that it's worth worth anything. That's also what I and one of the things exactly. I was wondering is how do you roll this project out? Because if you have ten people who use it, it's hard to go down to your local bakery and say sign up for this and then we'll trade your coins <laughs> so how do you how do you go yeah, about yeah. rolling it out because i th i mean a whole community will have to trust each other right for it to work since also mm -hmm. since you have to trust each other to even be able to make the trans the transaction right exactly exactly no that's a very good point no and it's it also brings up the broader point that all money any money to work in it's really trust even state money is really based on on trust. It's also based on uh, violence, of course, but uh, it's really based on like the trust that the community gives it. Um, with circles in the pilot in Berlin, what we've done is actually uh, a type of redemption uh, program or subsidy program with the local businesses. Okay. So we tell we tell them, okay, if if you accept circles up to a specific uh, limit, uh, we can give you euros in return so that you have less risk right and yeah. then the goal i just had a meeting about this today actually like the goal is basically to over time uh decrease the amount of uh collateral. of this cash out rate of yeah. the collateral exactly that the businesses accept so that they can actually have more spending within the circles right uh so that you know on a business to business level they can trade and exchange and actually grow the local economy so that over time they can depend less and less on the on the on the collateral yeah. so it's really about building local like, economic power uh that then you can have you know more and more autonomy so this is this is an interesting way i mean we we took this uh idea from the gyeonggi system in south korea um and so far it's working well like you know we have many businesses in the network there's a lot of trade going on and so on uh yeah, I think our biggest challenge right now is really, um, yeah, making sure that we have more uh, efficient and resilient infrastructure because Circus is a very complex system and there's a lot of moving parts that have to work together. So it like functions very smoothly. So right now we're at a moment where we're kind of like making sure that uh, all the technical stuff can work really well so that after everything is more smooth, we can then expand it to like bigger players because yeah. there's a lot of people on the pipeline, but if you grow a system, but you don't have like uh, the smooth technical like layers, it creates more care work for the, um, for the people who are, you know, engaging with these businesses, talking to them, doing all the sort of accounting and administrational yeah, sure. work and so on. So 
it's, it's an interesting experiment. I think I think Web three in general, like uh, the crypto world or the technological stack, um, wasn't really built for uh, at the very beginning. I think for uh, these type of systems, um, like that are more based on like local trade and engaging with like people with real resources or so, so on. Yeah. So it's interesting to see now how we're kind of moving in this direction and what is the types of infrastructure that can allow that to actually flourish. Yeah, of course. And I, I feel like maybe you would either have to enable other layers into the system to really make it more smooth because I get how you, it's really nice that you have this trust between people, but it can also maybe hinder transactions a little bit because you really need to have that trust. Have you guys thought about maybe having some like validators or I read a bit about like liquidity mm. pools maybe for people to more easily be able to have that kind of centralized trust or does that kind of like destroy the whole point or what do you think about that? No, definitely. I mean, this was always in the, the drawing board from the beginning when we were thinking about circles. We always knew that um, we will need some sort of um, yeah, validation that sort of helps to facilitate the trust, so to say. Um, so maybe for context, uh, the Circles system is based on a currency plurivex, how we call it. So everyone who enters the system issues their own ERC-20 token. So there is not one token. Uh, and that means that uh, things can get quite complex as the number grows and there is trust going on. And so as you said, it can be quite convoluted to try to send uh, lots of money from one place to the other. Yeah. And so this is one of the sort of issues that we're trying to deal with now in praxis. Um, but what, what that does is that once you go at a certain level of complexity, say uh, Berlin uh, or Denmark or whatever it is, um, we could issue now where uh, this is being developed at the moment, uh, something called group currencies. Uh, and group currencies are basically, uh, say, you, you me, and... Uh, uh, Grief and Gustav and Jeff and whoever else puts their circles, per, like the peer-to-peer -peer circles, onto a uh, onto a contract that basically yeah. issues out a group currency. So it could be kind of and become this one group currency. Yeah, exactly. This this exactly this group currency becomes uh, uh, a representation uh, of the trust of all of these uh, individual currencies personal currencies, and then you can use it to trade more easily. So it becomes more efficient. Yeah. Um, and you can add liquidity to this group currency because it is not just uh, on a peer-to-peer -peer basis. Nobody wants to buy Julio coins or Julio coins, right? Because you know, there is not too much to, you know, that you can uh, claim that it will, you know, have more value later and so on. But if it's a, a larger economy, then it becomes more interesting. So you can think about ways where this group currency could be used for both uh, like local trade, but also to ac have access to capital um, so that you could sell part of it, let's say as a business or as a, as a group, say, hey, I'm gonna you know, sell some of this group currency and then access uh, things like DAI, for example, or you know, even state money. Yeah, that's, that's definitely in the, on the roadmap. It's just a question of, of, yeah, now probably a few weeks now to, to start testing it, but yeah, it's it's definitely coming. Yeah, okay, that's really cool. But right now, it's more the next step is to make it like more smooth and make sure the infrastructure that is there already works, right? Yeah, that and also the group currency too. They're coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. And also, like the way I understood it, once you make your account like our account you once you <laughs> sign up or on the the system or the chain you start making these uh, for example i would make m10 coins right and you'd make julio coins and then if we trust each other then we can trade them right but people that don't trust us and we don't trust them they can't trade it but what i was wondering right you have this like inflationary system because more and more coins will be generated right so shouldn't the the rate of coins generated also excel at kind of the same rate that the inflation does, if you know what I mean? Because otherwise, let's mm. say in like 20 years, if I still only generate the same amount of coins that I did at the beginning, but there are 20 years more coins, then 
like mm -hmm. the generation I'm making wouldn't be worth very much. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's 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 part of why we did that. So, I mean, so two things. Um, uh, uh, this is how what you explain is basically how the system uh used to work. We recently changed it about a month ago to go from a, an inflationary paradigm to one based on demirage, uh, or like the idea that money decays over time. What so is demirage? Just for you can so think about it. Understands. Demirage, you could think about it as a type of holding, uh, holding tax on money or a, or a parking fee, uh, on money. So, you know, instead of the monetary supply constantly increasing, as as you know, what was the, the case in terms of uh, inflation? Yeah. In this sense, now the money supply, uh, you know, you you get uh, circles every day. But then the relationship between how much you get and the, this this demirage uh, or or like holding tax or, or however you want to call it will change over time. So that um, let's say after 15 years, the amount of, of basic income that you get is equal to the amount of demirage. Uh, so that the people who are longer in the system pay more into the system. Um, and the people who just joined get a lot more basic income in relationship to their uh, demirage. So then we did that as a way to actually get money out of circulation. Um, and yeah, it acts as a yeah, type of uh, a, a taxation mechanism that is, uh, you know, a lot less uh, violent than the ones we have today. And we're trying to <laughs> test it as a way to say what happens if we can... Uh, uh, you know, because the theory of demirage and the practice of it is that it allows for money to circulate more because yeah. people know that if they don't use it, it would kind of disappear or it would so like it kind yeah, of incentivizes kind of like, yeah, people to it. use yeah. it. Yeah, is that exactly. would that tax be exactly. like on a monthly basis then or a daily one or? Well, technically, I believe it's calculated on uh, uh by second, <laughs> so it's based okay. on time. Uh, yeah, so. Um, right now it's a seven percent a year, but then that's divided by the amount of seconds within a year. So it's actually yeah. very, very little every every second. Um, but over over the years, it sort of It'll grows, be right? Seven so total. yeah, okay, seven percent. Yeah. So right now, actually, you get twenty. Well, you get twenty four circles per day, minus the demirage. Okay. So is that so one, one around one circle an hour? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So we're trying to mix a bunch of ideas together and see what comes out of it. Uh, you know, normally time-based money are called uh, time banks, uh, but the way the Circles Network functions is more like a mutual credit-like system, even though it's not run by a sort of a a one uh, like manager or something. It's really more like a mesh net uh, in that sense. But it does has this this principle of of, uh, of mutualism, um, and then, and then, yeah, with the demirage, it's interesting to see what will happen. Uh, because I mean, for money to work, you need a way to have money creation, but also money destruction. Yeah. Right. If you have only one, uh, it becomes harder to anchor it somewhere. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And I, I guess those are some of the principles also that some people see could maybe compete with fiat currencies today, right? Do you feel like you could eventually develop the system to, I mean, of course it wouldn't be about universal basic income then, but have some of the same principles compete with uh, the way the financial system works today? For example, in terms of taxation, right? For me, at least in Denmark, it's mm -hmm. on a monthly basis. It's It doesn't work every second, right? But that's pretty smart. Mm. Yeah, about competition, uh with the uh, normal financial system. I think the thing is like, um, when you're talking about the financial system, you're dealing with a very complex and large um, uh, yeah, system of monetary, uh, of, of debt or, or, or money. So, you know, as uh, some people say, you know, finance is other people's debt. So there's a bunch of people swapping uh, contracts and, and papers around that really just mean a bunch of debt being moved from one place to the other. Yeah. With circles, what's interesting is that 
because people are sort of claiming the power over monetary creation, over the creation of 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 promises, so to say. Um, they're saying, you know, this money that I created is mine, and I can uh, then send it to you if you trust me. Um, and that fabric can potentially become a, a counter power to the financial system, um, but it has to be really rooted in, uh, you know, other structures. So, for example, what I was saying before that if you have a business that needs access to capital, uh, we've seen that in circles, like you know, with, with the subsidy we do with euros, you know, you cannot just sort of transition like that to another economy. You need to have this uh, threshold, this bandwidth, where you can sell your digital assets, get euros, and then put that in a put that in a in a collateral for like the business to have less risk. And as you grow the productive capacity of that economy, you can rely less and less on the state money or like the financial system. So it's 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 really an interesting question when you ask about how to actually compete or how to actually make that transition out, you know, to a new financial system. You really yeah. need to uh, make sure that the territory that the money you're using has enough uh, capacity so that it can rely, you know, more and more on this new network. Yeah, it has to rely uh, on itself. On the, right. It, yeah, but but it's interdependent, right, to the fiat money. So yeah. you need to make sure that that interdependence gets less and less yeah. and, and you have to build more local economic power. Otherwise, it's really hard. And I think if the whole world, you know, uh, is dependent on this huge financial system, you, you really have to start uh, in many regional you know, parts of the world, like at a very regional local level saying, hey, how can we build local economic power here? How can we create forms of counter power that can... You know, actually build more commons or more uh, public infrastructure, uh, communal infrastructure, um, so that you can rely less and less on on the hegemonic system. But again, I think it's a process. Like you, you cannot just transition because effectively today we are locked in to the to the state money system. Like you know, it's it's really hard to get out yeah. of. Yeah, and everything else you introduce somehow ends up becoming based on that system, right? Exactly. Yeah. Even crypto, right? Even crypto is denominated in dollars. Yeah. Or euros, right? Yeah, and you sell it to get dollars or euros. Yeah. That makes sense. Exactly. Have you guys faced any like um, legislative issues on the project, or any like, for example, in Berlin, were there any any resistance regarding the lawfulness of it, or is that not really something on your mm -hmm. mind? Yes. No, I mean it is definitely on our minds, uh, but I, it's we're not at a at a level yet where you know the, the finance amt has actually come knocking at our door and saying, "Hey, what's going on?" Like we're trying to actually have a lot of documentation of the process and good accounting to show what we're doing. Uh, so when like the regulators come knocking, we can say, "Hey, this is an actual alternative. Could you please regulate with it and not against it?" You know because. At the end of the day, uh, because these are so new things or systems, there is really no uh, like specific set of laws for it. So we're in this gray zone trying to navigate and create this local economy. Uh, and once we're big enough, they will notice. But when they come, we already have sort of a yeah some answers or some way of uh, uh, engaging them in the dialogue rather than. In this sort of uh, punitive approach <laughs> <laughs> yeah that makes sense <laughs> well thank you so much julio uh i think that was actually it is there Ooh. is there anything you'd like Thanks to so much, to add before i let you go yeah no you can follow us on twitter at circles ubi also on instagram uh and also please follow the cca which uh, we created with so much love uh with gustav and grief uh, a few years ago and many 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 other people um yeah, and thank you so much, Anton, for keeping the, the fire going. <laughs> all right, awesome. And I'll make sure to uh, put all of uh, Circle UBI's uh, different socials and all that jazz down in the description. So everybody who's interested can go there to look. All right, thank you, Julio. Thanks, Anton. Take care. <laughs>